Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to invite you to our program once again. And today's program is uh, somewhat sad, but also uh, we can celebrate what's going to happen to our guest. We welcome to our program the outgoing president of North Idaho College, Dr. Michael Burke. Our distinguished president has recently been appointed as president of San Jose City College in California. And after eight and a half years with us, he is uh, unfortunately leaving us. And we want to take this time to honor him and to review his very successful years. I have served under five presidents at North Idaho College. And I have to say that Dr. Michael Burke is just a model of what a president should be. And, and we welcome him to our program. Uh, he holds a baccalaureate degree and also a master's in art, both in English from the University of Houston, and his PhD is in community college leadership programs uh, received at the University of Texas at Austin, one of the fine universities in our country. Dr. Burke, welcome to our program, and um, we wish you the very best in what you're uh, undertaking in California. Thank you, Tony. Appreciate As it. Always, I'm very pleased to have our regular panelists, and I'm happy they both could be here today to honor our president. Uh, first of all is Janelle Burke, who is an attorney in the state of Idaho, and next to her is Erna Reinhardt, who is Director of Public Relations at North Idaho College, and Janelle will commence today's questioning. It's a pleasure to be here to visit with you today and to acknowledge your many achievements. Um, we share a common last name, although <laughs> I, I don't know that we're related. We'd like to claim you as part of our family, but um, I do want to ask you about the changes that have occurred at NIC since you've been here in the physical plant. There have been a great uh, many improvements since you've come, and so can you tell our viewers about some of the ways NIC has changed during your tenure uh, that has to do with the physical plant, please? Well, my, my father always reminded me that most of Western Ireland is named Burke, so uh, <laughs> we probably are related yes. somewhere along that line. but. When I came here, and we had uh, luckily uh, gotten some funding to do facilities master planning, which uh, is something I, oddly enough, I've always enjoyed doing. And uh, to me, uh, facilities master planning really is um, an opportunity to express the mission of the institution out there in bricks and mortar on your campus, if you think of it that way. And we took it very seriously. It's probably the most comprehensive facilities master plan we'd ever done. The uh, state of Idaho funded it. Uh, gave us the, the money it took to get a very comprehensive plan done. The wasn't uh, simply above the surface. We actually went in underground and mapped the entire infrastructure of the institution, which not many people realize because you never look at that sort of thing. But uh, half of that work was underground. And so we've, we've left, I think, a legacy of infrastructure detail that wasn't here when I got here. But we also mapped out you know, what it would take to hold five to 6,000 students on this site. And that gave us the ability to site buildings like the new residence hall, which um, right across the street from the new health science building and the new, right adjacent to the new student union building. And there's a real sense of interconnectedness that's between, you know, several hundred students living on your campus and where they live. In many ways, that student union building is their living room. So. Um, they eat there, they study there, they pretty much live there. So uh, that was, I think, th a real change in the, the student life aspect of the campus. Of uh, Having students living here changes the feel for the institution. You change the way you deal with um, parking issues, the way you deal with uh, support services for students when they're actually living on your campus. Uh, the, I think the, obviously the most significant change that I'm, I think, the proudest of is the health science building. Uh, our nursing program, best in the state, probably one of the best in the nation in some of the worst facilities in the country. Uh, wooden buildings that we inherited from the mill, no one quite knows how old they are. Uh, they were getting by in that facility. Still 100% pass rates, 100% placement rates on national uh, nursing exams and put them into a facility that really they deserve along with the science programs. Uh, and bringing that synergy together is really something I enjoy doing. But uh, you may not recall, but early on, uh, I think Erna remembers this, we uh, tripled, quadrupled the size of the Children's Center. Another boon, I think, to our students, kind of below the radar screen for most folks, but really does provide a, 
state-of-the-art learning lab for what I think is a, a nationally recognized uh, early childhood education program. Uh, it's won the mayor's award. It's been recognized. It's it's an extraordinary facility, kind of out behind the the campus. Uh, the other, I think, changes that you don't see, and a lot of it is in the walls and under the ground on campus, and that is the technological infrastructure we built uh, through Steve Ruppel and Raleigh Jurgens' leadership. They are, they have been looking down long range uh, with a facilities technology plan that they've implemented. So we've. We've built another building, the cost of another building, but it's underground and it's in the walls of this building and other buildings, and the connectivity that's there is extraordinary. Our students are now podcasting and faculty are doing extraordinary things that no one ever imagined, you know, uh, eight, nine years ago. Uh, Reinhardt. Dr. Burke, welcome to the show again. Um, you talked about the bricks and mortar here on our Coeur d'Alene campus, but one of the huge things about your tenure here as our presidents is how our outreach programs have expanded and the facilities involved there too exactly so share with us give us kind of a, a summary of the things that you have done not only in those outreach areas but also how that has affected the delivery of our programs as well as what that means to access for those peoples in those communities well I'd like to brag about uh, Dr. Jerry G who who uh, recently retired from NIC uh, a year or so ago to go into private consulting around facilities management, something he's, he's extraordinarily talented at. Jerry uh, and I, early on, uh, had a joint vision for outreach. We realized this campus wasn't going to hold too many more students uh, at the time without new buildings, and that a lot of these folks just simply couldn't get here. Uh, I talked to I uh, had a conversation with Phil Corliss early on, teaches photography, and he, we talked about a student that was commuting from Priest River. What's that, 85 miles one way, somewhere up uh, Bonners Ferry area. And we just realized uh, the person was driving down here two days a week to take classes and realized that we've got to do something about that. Uh, I think the hallmark of community colleges is, is access. It's something that's been our mantra since we were founded is that we provide access. And if you have true equal educational opportunity, yet it's constrained by the fact that you have to commute in this climate, in this geography, you know, 150 miles round trip every day, something had to be done. So we had the opportunity combined with the Sandpoint folks to create a Sandpoint Center. They went in and carved out part of their downtown. They put the sweat equity into the building. They remodeled the building. They got us a break on the rent. Uh, they subsidized what we did up there uh, to the point we've outgrown it. We've now taken it, as Senator Broadsword reminded me, to uh, the uh, Ponderé area. And it's actually out of Sandpoint in the, in the Bonner Mall there. We've outgrown that space. There's, and when uh, our board chair, Rolly Williams, was there, he was already mapping out where the next opportunities to grow in the mall were. You know, if right. we just move other people out, we'll just take over this whole <laughs> end of the mall. So there's that sense of growth and opportunity there in Sandpoint that you realize people would not be going to college if we weren't there, period. It just wouldn't happen, and that's not right. The, you, whether or not you go to college shouldn't be dependent upon you know, whether or not you can get there, in my mind. We've done the same in Kellogg. Uh, the Kellogg folks pretty much abandoned City Hall. If you think about it, the mayor, city council, chambers, all that was going on in City Hall, which is a, probably a turn of the other century building, and they moved out. They moved out into headquarters down the road by the Bunker Hill Mine that I think the EPA left behind so that to go from one office to the other, you had to go outside and walk around and to talk to your colleague on the other side. Not, a, not an ideal location. They, they left City Hall for us, remodeled it, put uh, a Vista came in and changed the power. We had dirty power, whatever that is, but apparently had power surges. They went in and uh, put new transformers on the building for us. Uh, the whole community came together and made that happen. Uh, if you've ever been in that building, there's a jail still downstairs. That's how old it is. And uh, it's a, there's a one-cell jail down there that we keep our file servers in. So we apparently have the most secure file servers in uh, North Idaho, complete with the old skeleton key. Um, we've done the same in Bonners Ferry. They, they approached us seeing the success we've had in Sandpoint, saying we want, we'd like the same opportunity. So. Uh, the Kootenai Tribe is paying the rent on that facility for us, I think, for two or three years to get us started. The uh, city, the Economic Development Agency, eight or nine partners got together and found us a space and found us a way to get us in there. 
Uh, we're not fully operational. Uh, it's an expensive endeavor, but um, <coughs> I think in the next couple of years we'll be able to get you know, the technological infrastructure into Bonners Ferry to make that happen. I'd like to do the same. If I were here, we'd be doing the same uh, down south in Benoit County. That's the last spoke, I think, in the, in the five northern counties. But again, it wouldn't happen without community partners. Uh, just right before Christmas, Coldwater Creek uh, wrote us a check to underwrite a whole computer lab for the Bonner Mall Center. Uh, just that kind of outreach makes it happen faster. That legacy is just breathtaking, <laughs> both in, in actual building facilities and, uh, you know, the new uh, resident halls is a remarkable building. The, the student union is one of the best in the whole region, and all these that you've identified. But there's another legacy of Michael Burke, and you know where I'm headed. Uh, all of that is very, very important, and it, it, it causes us to think about how we can serve students, and, and certainly in rural areas, and they, don't, they can, in the end, get associate without being here. But, Dr. Burke, you have another legacy that's close to my heart. For our viewers who don't know, when you came here, you immediately got involved with the um, AACC, I believe it's the American Association of Community Colleges. You became very prominent, and you wound up on the executive committee, and that's a real honor to get that. Uh, there's a lot of community colleges. And you also uh, convinced them to create a committee that did not exist called the Diversity Committee, and you've, you've really been the pioneer in the nation with, the, with that association. But in addition to that, you have served on the Kootenai County Task Force on Human Relations, uh, which is, by the way, the, as we're taping this show, is having its 26th birthday today. And uh, you also have really been a, um, a spokesperson, actually used the bully pulpit at North Idaho College for diversity and human rights, and in, both in our policy and in programs, and you've always been there to support all of those. Uh, I will say things that you as, as a modest person would probably not say, but I would like for you to uh, react to that and, and for our viewers to know that this is, uh, you know, the brick and border, uh, border and all that is important, but also uh, the dignity of all persons is important, and you have had absolutely zero tolerance for prejudice and bigotry, and you speak out every time that that happens. So would you share with us um, some of your beliefs and philosophies of why you thought that was important uh, for you to be a leader in both at North Idaho College and the National Association. Well, Tony, your ears were probably burning. Uh, when I was down in San Jose last week uh, speaking to the faculty and staff, I bragged about you, and in particular in the work the task force had done and the accomplishments we've made here. It's, um, it's on your shoulders, mostly. Uh, you've, done, you've done all the heavy lifting, I think, uh, for this institution when it comes to human rights. But, uh, I would like to brag about what AACC has done. They do have a committee on diversity, equity, and inclusion. The title has expanded, it seems like, every year to bring in, you know, different aspects of the, the issues around human rights. And the, uh, I co-chaired that uh, committee last year with uh, Paula Cunningham out of, out of Michigan, an extraordinary lady. And they've identified as a strategic issue for AACC the American Association of Community Colleges. It's the national organization of 1,180 community colleges around the country. Uh, they've identified the equity gap uh, as one of the key core strategic concerns uh, for the organization. Uh, skills gap is another issue around how we compete on a global uh, competitiveness with uh, China and India and Japan and other countries, but they're really focusing internally on the equity gap. The, the uh, issues we have with underrepresented populations and the uh, challenges that they have in higher education. I give a lot of credit to AECC. They've taken a very, just received a recent publication of theirs today, oddly enough, and are front and center on the issue of this equity gap. I think that's a good way to describe uh, the challenge. Uh, and uh, it's not, it's not an issue I don't think, I think it's an issue they're going to stick with probably for the next, for the rest of my career probably. It's important to them, it's important to us on a national level. One other thing before I go back to the panel too, I, I've been such a supporter of yours and you, there's obviously reasons why that, that is so. And I, I want to recognize the Board of Trustees because not only did they choose you, but the Board of Trustees has also been very supportive of what you're doing. And without the Board, of course, those things can happen. But you've been a leader and they have been very supportive. I've talked to them about it before. One of the things I want to bring up as part of your legacy is that I think you also have been a teacher 
for all of our employees and all of our students and to the larger community. And, uh, and having the privilege of speaking at your uh, reception, going away reception, I think that's really important to, to be a model and, and a leader. It's difficult to be president of a college and, and there's criticism at times and there's emotions and I always watched you and I never saw you once lose your dignity or, or, or your respect for others, even when maybe it would have been almost justified. <laughs> so uh, I want you to speak to that as you're leaving us, to, as for those who follow you and all as, as a model. Um, it's who you are, it's an internal part of Michael Burt, but it's also comes from a southern background we both have and all. And we've talked about that a lot of times, but share with people why they should uh, be very cautious about what they say or do in relation to other human beings in relationship when they're in a position of importance to make decisions. Well, you're right, I don't have much tolerance for, uh, you know, the way sometimes people treat their colleagues. It's, I think it's on rare, rare occasions and sometimes it's provoked, but I think it's that on those occasions when I think your true values show. I don't have a lot of use for uh, the kind of bullying tactics uh, that maybe you're referencing. I, you can never take those words back. You know, as, from where I sit, it's a very public position. I don't, um, I don't, I get no pleasure out of being vindictive or uh, mean-spirited. I have tried to avoid that throughout my career. You have succeeded. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's, um, I, you know, th there is a, uh, AECC just had a, a recent publication on it about civility as an issue on college campuses, not just between students and faculty, or st it's between students and themselves, and administration and faculty and uh, boards and the public, and the whole issue of civility is, is one that seems to be lost sometimes, I think. It was the way I was raised. It may be a Southern thing, I don't know. Southern thing, I guess I ought to say. But uh, it's, it is who I am, and I, I, I believe in that civility that we owe each other, uh, that basic human respect. Uh, it is sometimes, you know, it is, it is behavior that sometimes is hard to model. It, 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 uh, you, you want to say things that you just can't. And I think um, the public arena is better off for it when you don't say it. Yeah, thank if you so helps. much. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Janelle Burt. Well, Tony talked a little bit about the American Association of Community mm -hmm. Colleges and your role in that, and of course, presidents of colleges are busy going to meetings, I think, must be all the time, and you must work all the time because there is so much to be done, not only meetings, but other kinds of things. But um, I want to ask you this time about curriculum. Um, in community colleges, it would seem to me that the curriculum is somewhat more fluid than it is in uh, the general four-year college curriculum, uh, because it has to be. Um, as well as all curriculums being somewhat fluid. So uh, why has curriculum changed during the time you've been here? Well, I, you know, I, in a previous life, taught classical literature, and there's not a lot of change in that curriculum, as you That's can imagine. Right. So uh, if you look across the broad spectrum, our, I think the largest evolutionary trend is in our professional technical arenas, where you see programming uh, changing almost before it's published. You see degree plans and uh, career pathways changing, evolving, and uh, certificate options, and particularly in computer information technology and other programs, you see those trying to stay, you know, on par with the marketplace. We're trying to create graduates who can be employable in their field, who have basic core skills that all students need, that core curriculum, but really have the technical skills to then go to work, be employable, and um, you know, hit the ground running when they get into those industries. So those, uh, all the credit in the world to those folks. They're, they have to change their, it's almost not, why bother publishing it because it's going to change by the time the student graduates. Uh, that's uh, I think where the largest change is, but um, I think beneath the surface, maybe not curriculum, maybe not directly curriculum, but the whole instructional component of what we do has evolved uh, exponentially based upon the technological applications that you see in classrooms. I was over visiting with uh, Peter Zayo. I walked by his office and he was somehow uh, able and working on the technology to take his, he's captured his lectures and the materials he presented, I think on PowerPoint, 
in his classroom and was broadcasting them out through internet links to students off campus through their iPods or other handheld devices where they're, they are in his classroom basically live while, while he's lecturing. I don't know how it works. I, you know, I used to follow technology. It's moved on, I think, faster than I can keep up with it. But we're able to do that. The idea that this, we have students out there at a distance and Peter and his other colleagues are finding ways to to get this material out there. You miss class, it's out there. Uh, the nursing uh, faculty are you know, doing, we have these simulated people. I don't know if you've seen the technology in nursing, but uh, they call them sim man. It's actually a simulated person that talks to you and interacts and uh, you have to diagnose his issues. All that's being captured electronically, it's being digitized, it's being put on the web, so you can, as long as you have the patience, you can sit there and watch an intubation. Uh, over and over and over again. You can sit in, it can be demonstrated across the hall in a, a what appears to be a, a hospital room and you're sitting in an auditorium with 150 other students watching it being demonstrated live and it's all being captured. It's on the internet, it's on a website. Those kinds of instructional opportunities were never there when I was a student and uh, really haven't availed myself of them since I'm not in the classroom like I used to be. But that's, that's an extraordinary change. I don't know you know, if you're waiting for it to be over, it's never going to be over. You know, it, it's, our students do not learn the way, my daughter's 12, she does not learn the way I learned. Uh, she has a different kind of approach to it. I think her brain is wired differently than mine is, simply because of how she's learned since she was six weeks old. But also, there is a, a visionary aspect of this, and also in the budget you had to do that to cause these things to happen. <laughs> so. With that, Erna Reinhardt. Ouch. Yeah. President Burke, um, this year and last year, we've spent a lot of time as a state talking about a community college system. Mm -hmm. And I just want to give you the opportunity to talk a little bit about the role of community colleges. But I know another favorite topic of yours is collaboration and how we as a community college collaborate with those four year schools and how those four year schools collaborate with each other. So talk a little bit about what happens locally between mm -hmm. NIC and U of I and LCSC and then on a state level how that can work. Well, as we talked about expanding community colleges in Idaho, I was the first person to say there should be a community college on every street corner. I believe in that kind of access. That is what has made community college, I think, the leading force in American higher education. We enroll about 46% of all the students in American public higher education. <laughs> Think about that. 46% um, of everybody in public education. I'm a huge fan of community colleges. It's my mission in life. I think there ought to be one on every street corner. The challenge we face in Idaho is how do we do that? Uh, how do we do that? And I believe fundamentally they should be locally governed, locally controlled, uh, supported, um, financially by the local community and that's the model we have in Idaho that's what made CSI and NIC the poster children for community colleges is that exact form of governance how do you do that across the state that where those values aren't necessarily shared by other parts of the state and how do you do whatever you're going to do and hold NIC and CSI harmless because I think the last thing we wanted to see out of all these discussion was a completely different governance model and a different financial model. We wanted to be held harmless, yet we wanted to expand access. That's going to take money. Uh, and I don't think anyone could logically tell you that we're going to be able to expand and create more community colleges without putting more money on the table. Uh, you will build economic development, you will build an economy, um, if you look at the return on investment a community college represents, the last time we had it measured in 2005 by a nationally known, nationally recognized uh, group of demographers and economists, they said we put $301 million back into the local economy annually because we create intellectual wealth. So you have to look at the long range impact of what a community college represents. Not, not just our payroll, you know, all the money we put back, all the goods and services we buy, but the intellectual capital of people who get an education, who go to work in your community generating bigger salaries, spending that money in your community, and you're collecting personal income tax on it. So the whole thing feeds a much bigger system. We want to be held harmless through that process, and I think that's where we've 
I think as a, as a, through the interim committee and what uh, Governor Otter just recently said about uh, in his State of the State address uh, that supports local control, supports the creation of community colleges through the statutory means that we have available to us. He also found new money to do it with, you know, with the surplus we have, put new money on the table for incentives for local communities to get started. It's all very positive. I think it was the right way to go. He also talked a good deal about student financial aid and the need to create an opportunity for student financial aid, which is another thing. Uh, uh, it's not just accessibility, it's affordability that makes us successful. Um, in terms of collaboration, we coexist here with, you know, we're the landlord and have been for a couple, three generations for U of I Coeur d'Alene and LCSC Coeur d'Alene. I've told them from day one, I don't care where students get a baccalaureate degree. If they want one, I want them to have the opportunity to get one here. And they can take their pick, but I want to facilitate that opportunity. And if you, I remember going to the graduation ceremony maybe two years ago at LCSE and watched all their baccalaureate degree nursing students walk across the stage, and I recognized all but one of them as one of our students. That's the way it ought to be. And anything we can do to make that happen is obviously in our best interest. We're running out of time, uh, President Burke, but I don't want to go off the air without <clears throat> not time to comment on it. But you, another legacy you, uh, you're leaving is your wonderful relationship with the Coeur d'Alene tribe. And we have, an, uh, before you got here, we had a nine point agreement, and then you have really helped with the implementation of that, and you've worked so closely with them. In fact, they've been very, very friendly to us, and the fact they're helping us with our legislative agenda. So. We want to recognize your work with the Coeur tribe, and I know that they have an affection for you and that uh, they hate to see you leave, but they appreciate the work you've done here. With this, Dr. Michael Burke, we have to bring our program to conclusion, and we wish you well at San Jose City College, and don't forget to come home from time to time, and, and we're terribly, just extremely grateful to you for all this. You're, you're, this legacy, I'm just so pleased with this show. You just, we've shown so much what you've done, and, and um, Thank you again for all you have done, and I know I speak for the panel and the staff, and we say thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please be with us again next week at this same time when we'll move to yet another issue, and I know you've enjoyed this program with uh, saying farewell to Dr. Burke. Until next week, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest-running in-house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station. Music